And today I brought like two stories um, to, to show you a little bit on the translational aspects that we try to well, make our attempts in also what we learned so far that, um, well, it's not as easy as sometimes people think. Um, well, to get you on, on the same page, I, I brought this uh, general overview on the regenerative therapies for the heart. It's not so different, I think, if you focus on the angiogenic part or try to stimulate uh, angiogenesis for different organs or try to block it uh, in the tumor world. It's also the that is now in there. Um, so here on the left are numbers to show you in the cardiac fields we're doing a pretty good job. And what we mean by that is that if you think about the acute death, both male and female, since the 80s, they dramatically dropped. As you can see that, and that due to reperfusion therapies, all kinds of drugs on the market. So we do, at least in, in the north part of Europe, I know this is the case, we didn't even discuss whether it's the same here in Italy, but I think in, in, in the north part, this is happening a lot. And if you look at the heart, I assume you know these type of pictures with the left ventricle, the right ventricle, that the acute phase of myocardial infarction is where the cell death is happening. And uh, while in the 80s, still a lot of people died to that, and there's still people dying of that, but most of them just survive and they move to this second part of the problem. Basically, what we do with this, this acute survival rate, we move the disease into a chronic disease, and that's what we call heart failure. And during this talk today as well, I, I would like to focus you on that, that basically it's, it's the, 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 the disease area we focus on is the reduction in contactility that we show in this, this area. And of course, there are different degrees of heart failure, also a filling problem, but today I would like to zoom in a little bit on the contactility problem there. And you understand now why we have so much, well, increasing numbers of people failing in the end and, and realize that one out of three, one out of four people having a myocardial infarction will develop heart failure within five years. And realize as well that within five years after you get a diagnosis of heart failure, people die. It's like 50, 60 percent. And what we have so far for these patients is cardiac transplantations and we have the mechanical support devices, the LVETs. That's what we have for these patients. And that's why this whole field of regenerative medicine is so much booming and also making big steps of these big attempts and pushed forward so dramatically maybe for our i'm also a basic scientist so for us basic scientists sometimes too quick but realize that there is no option at all for these patients and that's why this field is pushed so hard as well um also brings me to this slide in which this cartoon shows you all kind of generations of cells and products that have pushed before from the preclinical stage into all kind of phase three trials and i well and, and I think I can summarize in that, that we all kind of failed, showing no benefits. So we have tried molecular cells, stromal cells, we have tried all kinds of products from these cells put into patients, but in the end they were safe, there was not a problem. Luckily, we didn't see any problems in these patients, but also they didn't benefit. So the um, efficiency of, of ejection fraction, recovery or functional benefits was marginal. Um, so there is a whole field now moving, okay, what is happening if you do therapies to the heart? Why did we see successes early on and we, why would you fail? I would like to take you along a little bit what we learned so far, at least in our lab setting, but also what I think a lot of other labs have learned. And today I would like to zoom in on two parts. One is really a muscle replacement. I so show you a little bit more of advanced engineering. And in the end, I will go back to like the self healing properties of secretions of these cells and also how we can use that in, in, in manipulating maybe like lipid nanoparticles or other constructs and then to bring maybe a little bit closer to what you feel uh, of, of needs or uh, overlapping project, projects. Um, so this is an evaluation that we did a few years ago and then if I zoom a uh, step one back here you have the Murica cells which is the first generation of cells and we believe many years back it was also with Marisha Gaumans and Peter Dubonans uh, that you also met uh, recently uh, Serena, um, that there is also cardiac derived stem cell and there is a lot of debate whether that's true or not. Uh, we have a lot of publications that you can isolate on these cells. You can push these cells into bleeding clusters in a culture. So I think we have cardiac derived progenitor like cells that would be used. And um, what people thought is that if you use these cells, they are way advanced because they can produce the cells that you need in the end in the cardiovascular system. So the monocular cells here or the stromal cells, it's really hard uh, to differentiate the material cell layers or into beating myocytes that you need in the end for these therapies. While these cells, at least in our hands, we could do that. However, if you think about the translation aspect, I'm not sure how familiar you are with meta-analysis and systematic reviews. So basically you summarize all publications that are out there 
And that's what we did a few years back. So to do analysis of all the publications using these type of cells, and what is the effect size in the end? Basically, this is summarizing what you see, maybe even the, this next sli slide. So if you have small animal models and you inject cells, locally, they do something, they have a benefit. And that's usually some, something around 50 to 20% injection fraction improvement. And the injection fraction is the fraction of blood, it's four thousand. I assume you guys know that. However, if you move to larger animals, you see that the effect drops. Of course, the organs are bigger, there's other problems there. And as soon as we enter into the patients, it's inevitable. The effect sizes are dropping towards one, two percent, and that's not the therapy you want to have in a patient because it will never be successful translated into a clinical work. So this is for this second generation of cells. We thought that was the best cell at that moment. The same counts true for the first generation of cells. So if you inject monoclonal cells, they also have these type of well, stacked efficiencies. And, and they all thought, okay, the cells don't, don't do the good job, or uh, it's the animal model that do, they do the best uh, mimics of the patients. But also, we found out that other things are happening. And it's also, I think, relevant if you think about therapies uh, based on LMPs or AUVs or whatever it is. What we saw is that the retention of these cells is poor, and it's even worse as if you can imagine. So what we did here was an, an, a large animal project where we compared three different uh, captor-based uh, delivery systems. So via the coronary systems, such so you could do balloon dilations, it's really doing patients. With a catheter and you can have an, an, a little injection needle on top of that, you can put it into the ventricle wall. So you can really have a local delivery of products or you can have like an open surgery, open chest surgery. And well, you basically see where is the problem and you can inject it in. And if you do a comparison there, you radioactively label this, this cell types. And we did this for this first generation of cells, also the second generation. This is the patterns that you can see. So with the infusion, you see this banana shaped appearance of the infused area which you infuse the cells. Or you have these little patches where there are like a little pose of cells in, in the, cell, in the uh, acceller matrix of the ventricle. However, if you do a quantification, you see that there is not a big difference between these different aspects. So around 10 to 15% of the cells they retain in, in the heart. And this is only four hours after injection. Um, to be honest, I was really surprised about the amount that stays behind if you just infuse it. But also this is really low. And if you quantify the amount somewhere else in the body, most of the cells ended up into the lungs. And we never understood that part. Until one of my PhD students, Frederick von Acker, we thought, okay, let's make a simple experiment. Usually that gives the best answer, so let's make it simple. So I will show you here a movie in which we just infused here a uh, uh, little product of cells. We labeled them fluorescent green with some contrast agent. The contrast is used in the clinical setting as well to see dilations, to see the vascular, vascular patterns. And we infused that here in this movie. And uh, the statement, this is a non bleeding movie. This just visualizes that it's easier to see. But also the similar thing happens in, in a full contracting organ. And this is what you see. So this is the black contrast that you see, and you see this patterning happening. And if you just do this local injection, this is what we observe after several animals. And what we always thought is that this is this diffuse penetration into this tissue, but that's it's not, it's following a pattern. And we thought, okay, this is then the coronary system, this is the lymphatic system, or the vasculature, or the venous system. And what we could uh, Determine in the end with fax analysis, we put a catheter into the sinus cornearies, which is the exit route where the whole finest tree of the heart comes together. It's on the right side of the heart. And if you put a catheter in there, at the moment of injection, this is what this claim, or this, this little part claims. So, zero minute post injection, the moment you inject cells in the heart, at the moment the cells, so the green dots here in this fax analysis, are already in the sinus cornearies. So, they're already removed from the heart, or in the right side of the heart. And as you probably understand physiology, the right side of the heart goes to the lungs. And that's why the cells are in the lungs. It's, it's trapped there in the capillaries because it's very small. So apparently if you do any therapy here, cell-based in the heart, you treat the lungs because of this feeling of that. And I felt, I usually feel really stupid to present this on master programs, whatever. This is in 2016, but well, they started the first clinical trial in 2002. Why never people saw that or noticed, I don't know. We try to inject cells more and more and more and more, but they'll just get into the system. Although I will come back later, there are some paracrine effects of these cells seen that might be still due to this because they're trapped in the lungs. Maybe they influence the immune system or whatever that we still have to affect there. But that's the second part of the story. So what I would like to zoom in here, 
this can we improve this? And we started early on with that simple improvement. Okay, if you have clumps of cells, if you make them bigger, does that help? And then this is stories of two years, few years back from Dries Faya, where we had this little gelatin beads. You can cross-link, you can label, you can follow. And then we put our cells on top of that. And then we used luciferase uh, overexpression just to show them easily and, and to quantify them uh, better. And you can see definitely if you do a, like a two-day evaluation, the f well, it's almost like 30 to 50 times increase in cell retention if you have these clusters of cells. So it really helps if you make them bigger, it gets stuck into the system or the heart or whatever, and at stage, the retention improves. However, coming back and also in the pic, that's just to, to summarize that it works. However, if you look at functional benefit and then I have to explain it a little bit. So this is the drop in left ventricle ejection fraction. So in the PBS group, it drops 20%. So you have the disease model. By infusing this complex cells, I think it improves. It's significant there. The start always makes significance, of course. But if you then compare it to just the progenitor cells, so the flush out cell procedure that I just described, the, the difference is not that big. So that made us puzzle. And of course, we can look at vessels per, per square millimeter and some, some thickness of the walls. And there are some marginal changes there. But in the end, that's not the way to bring it forward again. And what we learned as well, I'm not sure if you looked already in this picture here. If you wait a little bit longer than this two-day follow-up, you see that the signals drop dramatically. So what happened with these cells, they are in little clusters in the heart. And then they start to detach from these, these carriers. And then they're crossed away again. So it's still like a temporary well, presence of these cells, and it's still it, it's it's not the way forward. So that's what we learned, at least from these procedures. You can help it, you could retention improve, but it's not something that we can push forward with our clinical uh, departments there. So that we need something else, we need better, because in the end, the, the functional improvements are not there. And then, of course, the whole debate. So what what do we learn so far? Sorry, this is like a summary of 20 years of work in, in five slides that try to get you to the next level where, where we're working at now. What cells do we have to take? And what is the way to, to get this retention happening? Is this direct injection something that happens or that, that will work? Or do we need like patch preparations outside and then put it on top of that? Also, you can be used as, of course, as, as local cell or, or uh, drug delivery apparatus. And several other questions, I think they're all relevant, but also just easy questions that I think we will then raise here. So one thing I think that advanced the field massively in the last few years, I think you will guys do that the same, is, is the IPS work. So you use pluripotent stem cells. So I don't think there's any debate now anymore on which cells you have to take to do contractility repair of the heart. You need to bring in cardiomyocytes. And I think one of the only cell source that is without any debate would be the IPS. And maybe I'll well, show you a little bit on, on maturation state of these cells. That's probably a debate part still. But I think this is the way forward. And I think I don't have to introduce to you these cells and how they're generated, but correct me if I'm wrong, but we have, we have these protocols where you can use this, this monolayers of cells in, well, we, we use now like 300 million a week for our projects. So it's really up and running. And uh, you know this protocol, so the biopsies or the monocure cells from, from the blood you take, you reprogram, you have the IPS colony, and you can differentiate the different lineages that you want to do. Well, this is uh, for the chiomyocytes. I'd like to share a little bit is also, um, well, you need, well, a lot of cells. What I just said, we have 300 million cells a week now for our projects. So we set up uh, this, this protocol together with Jan van Bijkema, who was in Stanford uh, with uh, Woos Lab. And basically, uh, you see here the protocol that we use. I think a lot of people have similar protocols with B27 and insulin. Uh, you have just this 10 to 12 day protocol where the cells are pushed from IPS to mesoderm, cardiac mesoderm to the chiomyocytes. And then usually they are used here in this, this L11 to 12 day status. You can mature them mechanically or growth factors or whatever, and then a lot of people use them. But we figured out that, um, and that was something discussing with some project here as well, that if we do dense passaging and also expose them to this chert molecule, it will be easily increase numbers dramatically. And dramatically means really dramatically. So from the P0 is like a six wells plate with P4, which is only, well, a few weeks, you have millions and millions of cells. And that's not seen so far. Basically what we do here, we push based on, on dense passaging and this uh, small molecule, we push basically the proliferation of the chimiocyte. And the advantage of that is not only that you have a huge number of cells, basically you freeze these cells in a certain state, but after that you can still use them for all this, this purposes that you also do, I think the drug screens for patching or for individual models, 
the cells don't change. You freeze them in a certain way and you push them for several weeks and then they are still in the same state as people use them in this state. So we can prove it with protocols. And now several groups are using this and they can reproduce that as well. So a lot of teams now produce, well, this type of myocytes that also in this state, I think that's also crucial to know. You can also easier freeze them. You can freeze them, you can produce batches of cells, freeze them, also thaw them later and keep on packaging and start using them. Well, if you have this final stage of cardiomyocyte differentiation and freedom, you lose still like 50 or 60 percent of your again. So this might be really helpful in, in, in this in this work. What we did then next is also a state to understand how important is maturation in these cells. So we had this this immature cardiomyocyte that I think everybody is doing that so seven days or a week of, of differentiation, then a purification by removing the glucose. Then we replayed and we have this speculative well immature cardiomyocytes and then we start to challenge them to low oxygen and basically what to our surprise these cells don't react well in general cardiomyocytes should die of, of low oxygen of, of, of nutrition deprivation but if you look here like well it's it's almost 90 percent of uh, pure differentiated cells uh, they still profile a little bit but if you expose them to low oxygen viability stays similar except if we expose them to a um, more mature Protocol here, where low glucose and omega fatty acids and some of these, these compounds there, together with Mark McCullough from Central, we developed this protocol. And then we basically use the same cells, but have them more matured here. Then suddenly you see that the viability of the K67 drops here, but also the viability of these cells drop dramatically. And so maturing them a little bit, and this is relatively easy in, in two weeks, definitely uh, matters if you have functional follow up of your, of your cell types here. So we realize that if you do functional follow up, that, that these type of protocols are essential to move. Uh, but also what we see here, if you think about the metabolic, this is a seahorse assay, what you can do different stages on how oxygen consumption in these cells is regulated. That um, the maturation state determines which kind of substrate these cells use. And of course, you can mimic that because heart failure and, and healthy tissue also, they have yeah, different substrates, how to use that. And you see that if you do qualification of the apoptotic rate, that the mature cells, they really respond to the lower oxygen while the immature cells are the other. So if you do any cell survival assays you want to follow up here, it's important to, to at least understand this, this uh, little part. Um, but then move a little bit forward to a little bit more complex and maybe also of interest for you guys. Um, that Well, I, I showed you on this, this, this cardiomyocytes from the progenitor cells that we can inject that, but what about these cardiac patches and can we learn something there and what to do? And one of our first works was uh, done by Roberta Catani, who was from the Messina lab, from uh, our lab. And, Basically, what we what we tried is to use this this well selling like printers that we just briefly discussed. It's really easy, so it's it's that's an, an, an bio ink that you use. In this case, we used an aronic acid and also gelatin based. We put in our progenitor cell. This is again the secondary generation of cells at that time, and we can just make this simple print. It's like a little bandage, and and this little bandage you can put in culture dishes. This is also illustrated in this little movie, and also you can use a little part of that on a mouse heart. So we can mimic the myocardial infarction in the mouse model here, with a little ligature, and then we put on top this little bandage. That really, it works. And you can see that here with this BLI imaging, again, with this luciferase cells, that three months later, still half of the cells are there. And, and some of for instance, see like 80%. So there are hundreds of millions of cells still there after three months. That raises other questions. How can cells survive without linked perfusion and other things? But apparently they, they can do these kind of low metabolic uh, rates. But we run still in another problem. I will show you here a little bit the, the functional data sets. Um, the bandage remains here on top. This is the human cells, remains like a bandage on top of this mouth heart. So the integration is poor. It's really difficult to get it integrated. And that's probably because we use this tissue glue. It's like the fibrin based glue, which you can put in, in between. But apparently it also makes a layer really difficult to get this integration happening. And that's also why I realized, okay, we probably need a little bit better, different approaches. So this approach of the engineered heart tissue, you know, from Wolfram Zimmerman and, and Thomas Eschenhager, they have these big patches now implanted on the heart. It's really amazing, I think, what they do. But we thought we also have to do a little bit better because that concept is already there. Um, and, and also we need something else because it's really difficult to handle these constructs. And currently now, I think Wolfram is doing with this thick patch, it's easier to handle. You can stitch it to the heart. But at the moment, we didn't know yet. So we thought, okay, let's, let's make a different scaffold approach. We can do a little bit better design, also better handling. And what we start to use is uh, to use melted electro writing and not in the spray version you might have heard of. That's like random spraying ECL-based, uh, uh, well, 
melted uh, polymers. But really with this uh, uh, translation collector here, with the, this, this electrical uh, field that you can put it here, and I'll show you the movie that you immediately see what, what that means. So basically we can basically print this special based structures now in this way. And you can see that it's basically like now a scaffold wherein we can seed the cells and the hydrogels, and then you can use fibrin based gels or collagen based gels or gelatin based gels, depending on, on what you like to see. And we're making now these different concepts and constructs. Um, the, the, the good thing of this approach was also a little bit surprising. You can see them with now with the IPS derived cardiomyocyte. This I'll also show you this movie because we moved it to the large animals already. This is if you fold the scaffold, it has a kind of a memory shape appearance now because of this, this PCL based scaffold in there. So they start to unfold again. So if you have a minimal invasive procedure, you put it in this catheter tubing. You put it on top of the heart, it starts to unfold, and you can see it here on top of the heart. It's unfolding there with millions of pyomyocytes. Uh, although this is, of course, really a thin structure still yet. So, step one. The funny thing of, of design structures as well is that we, if we make a rectangle shaped um, uh, chamber of the scaffold or we make an hexagonal shape, the structure has different mechanical properties. So if you have the hexagonal ones, you can just put force like 30% what we expect as well in the heart. You can just put it on the scaffolds to remain, remain intact. While these rectangle ones, they, they rupture. And this you can quantify in all kinds of different ways. But also, they organize themselves better. So the rectangle ones, they organize themselves, uh, sorry, the hexagonal ones, they organize themselves better. And thereby also, well, it's a lot of detail, so please have a look at the publication. But they, they basically become more mature. These, these two pictures are highlighted in that. For that region, they become more mature and aligned as the original scaffolds. So apparently, just making a simple printed difference, also by mechanical different cues, it have also biological effects, and that results in, in in scaffold that is much more mature than originally thought, and also easier to handle. And this is also now in a European consortium called Brave, together with different partners from uh, from Europe and Portugal. And well, it's basically making multiple layers now on top of each other. And you can see this little movie here. It's like a one centimeter thick construct that we can generate now with this type of scaffold. And we try to implant that new together with, with Leuven, with Stefan Janssen's uh, lab on the large animals as well. And last week we were in Lisbon for this discussion. And apparently it works. So with this type of scaffold you put on top, there's like vascularization coming in. And then we have now first uh, well, high retention rates. Uh, functionally, we still have to be careful addressing that. But at least it's a way forward how you can make these type of scaffold. Um, so to wrap up this first part of the story, uh, it's like 20 years of work, eh? I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but we have started with, with cell types to take in the end to really repair the heart. And I think we really make big steps now with the IPS technology, with retentions, with, with bio inks and materials to move into, well, we have cells present, but how to link that to the that original heart and how to have functional integration. That's the part that we're struggling with, I think, a lot now with all the challenges with, with uh, engineering and other parts. So, because that links me to, well, of course, there's 20 years of work, which is, um, on one hand, how, how does it happen that so many people still work on these cells, injecting them? And, and of course, it's, it's uh, the need in the patients in the end, and maybe that the medical doctors don't always understand the basic part of the concepts that we try to develop, but also realize that we shot just effects. And the whole idea there, of course, that we transplanted cells, that they start to form new blood vessels or the, uh, well, myocardium. But, we also realized uh, really early on, I think, that there is kind of a paracrine secretion of these cells. That I think is what happens with all this generation of cells so far, even with IPS injection directly, that we still it's like a paracrine secretion of factors <coughs> changing the local environment. And that's also what we proved already many years back in this large animal model where we induced this microbiome infarction. This is this white area you can see here. If you inject then the, the, the conditioned medium, of stromal cells, so this is one of those third generation of cells. Basically, you can prevent the infarct here happening. So, and you can quantify that. So, if you put the secretions in there, the infarct size is reduced dramatically. Um, and also, if you compare it to injection with, for instance, saline. However, we also did some some uh, evaluations. So, which part of the secretions does this job? And in the end, it, it's it's not something that's smaller than a thousand kilodaltons. So we've thought already this probably like an IGF and AGF is growth factors and rich, these are produced by these cells, but probably something else. And we could figure out that it is a fraction that is really big. It seems to be linked to extracellular vesicles. 
And I'm aware that did you know, of course, what this is, but at least to put you on the same page. So these, well, bilipid layered small vesicles are secreted by basically every cell type that you have in your body. And they come in different flavors. Eh? So uh, we have apoptotic bodies, micro vesicles, exosomes, exomers, and basically um, we cannot distinguish them if you put them from a secreted culture or from bioproducts or biomarker studies. But we know that there are different origin how they are produced. Like for instance, the exosome coming from this multiple physical bodies from inside the cell, while the microvesicles, for instance, will just blab from the membranes. Of course, then the content of these vesicles can also be different. And you can see all kinds of these cartoons, how this mixture of vesicles are released by these cells. And well, early days that people thought, well, this is just garbage. It's also we just get rid of stuff and it's removed. But we now know that many of these vesicles have a function or at least can do stuff even in target cell. Um, because, well, they don't have any garbage part particles there, but they have all kind of lipids, DNA particles, proteins, mRNA, microRNAs, all studies are focusing on that part. And for our studies, we also zoomed in on, on these progenitors coming from the heart. So we will isolate them based on SCA1. If you then look at that medium, you can really see these tiny white spots here. And this is this NTA analysis where you can determine the size distribution of, of these vesicles in these cultures. And you can see that's like a 100 nanometer on average, thought to be like exosomal like extra vesicles repeated by these cells. You can spin them down. That way you can, this, this uh, ultrasonification, I will show you a little bit later how we do that. By EM, you can see this bilipid, well, little platelet-like uh, aggregates, but it's only a little bit smaller, like 100 meter, nanometer in size. Uh, because they are having a bilipid structure, they can also float around. So if you isolate them and you start to put them on a sucrose gradient and you spin them down, they also will find their, their uh, balanced uh, hemostatic uh, region and then for instance, if you use a pKH, which is stains the lipids in these uh, extracellular vesicles, you can really visualize if you use high amounts that they start to flow. It's basically, it, it's a small cell, you can call it in that way, at least for the lipid part. And then if you take different fractions with different densities, you can well, label them for all kinds of markers. And for instance, CD9, CD81, plotlin, those are markers known to be enriched in exosomal life uh, vesicles. You can really, well, pinpoint that it's not everywhere. It's really specific on the location. And for our therapeutic approaches, what we saw with, with our cells that we had a lot of pro-angiogenic effects. I think a lot of people show that if you inject it in the heart, you see vessel growth. And, and whether it's really vessel growth or any teal porphyry, we, we can still debate on that when it happens. But it was for us a reason at least to have these vessels exposed to endothelial cells in culture. And we have this HMAX, UVAX, and all kind of reason. Usually we didn't see really big difference. But what we could do is if we isolate vesicle fractions and normalize them from these different uh, fractions of the support gradient. And we label them with the first and uh, PKH. You can see that only this fraction was able to transfer these lipids, at least to the target cells. These are the cells in the culture monolayer layer, put on the EV on top, and only this fraction was able to transfer something. So there is also some specificity which vesicles are able to be taken up by the target cells and also have some messengers. And we also start to explore proteins and microRNAs in, in these fractions. But uh, to make a really short a story short, is that we saw benefits, we saw the effect of these extra vesicles, but also there's already a meta-analysis, there's always a meta-analysis of these type of approaches. Also looked here already how these vesicles can interact with target organ, organ, in this case, uh, the heart. And uh, there's already a warning here. If you look at all these publications, it's again, that's like this first and second generation cell that it's all like 25% effect size in the mouse. Then we go to a pig then suddenly drops back to 5% in the patient. We didn't test yet, but probably it went in the same direction. So. We need to improve parts here, and that's of course we're back in this cartoon. And that's also why my ESG consolidator appeared at the right moment. I think we, we start to understand that this is, might be a way forward to put the therapeutic in, but we have to understand things because it's the extracellular vesicles are a natural vehicle for solid communication. We have seen these observed effects, and it's definitely a potential of shell therapy uh, more than the cells because you still have the viability problems, and these vesicles are. I wouldn't say them inert, but at least you can, can do much more things there. But for cell the parts that we still have to improve is how to isolate them, how to get release criteria, the mechanism of action, how to improve delivery and, and those stuff. And I'll show you a, a few hints from my lab doing so. So one of the things is how to isolate these, these extra vesicles, if you like to, to work on that. And this is, of course, therapeutic way, but also if you like to see shell-cell communication studies, how, how do you isolate these vesicles? And, this ultracentrification is something that a lot of labs do because it's, I think, standard present in any environment in any uh, institution. So basically, it's a stepwise protocol where you spin just faster and faster and faster, discarding 
parts. And then here there are cells and cell debris. Here there's a pellet of larger constructs and complexes of proteins. And then you get your pellets of vesicles, such a rich vesicle uh, fractions. And we compared that basically to another technology I think that's, that's out there as well a lot uh, for a long time already, size exclusion chromatography, also separate proteins and other things. And also for vesicle that works, that you can separate the vesicles from the proteins with these this larger columns. Uh, and basically the reason why I did this comparison is to see, okay, how effective is the isolation of photosynthetization? Because a lot of people use that, but also you can imagine that spinning something and smash it against the wall is also damaging these biological ingredients. And that, that happens basically. So. If you take the EVs, you expose them to HMAX, and you do Western blot for phosphorylation of uh, ERP or AKTs, you can see basically that, that using this, well, mild exclusion chromatography improves the activation of these endothelial cells. So they're taken up by these cells and they start to activate the intracellular cascades. And that, well, still the ultracentrification can do something, but using SEC is better. At least it helps in, in the future part. And we followed up on that with, with uh, we'll skip a little bit on the details there, but this is our pipeline now that we have our conditioned medium. We have to spin it down. We do some soft filtration steps, then T, uh, TFF to, to really uh, spin out the, 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 the fraction that doesn't pass the 100 kD filter, then do this captive core, this is the sec column, and then do concentration steps. And so realize that this is already two weeks of work before the experiment starts. So it's, it's really elaborate and it's really extensive. So that's why we spend a lot of energy on different, well, storage temperature, precipitation steps, which filters to use. Because in the end, in the summary, you can see that if, if you, uh, well, optimize the steps, you can gain like 200 fold of the amount of vesicles that you can isolate. And that's kind of the report bringing that forward. And I think it's important to do so because for a lot of mechanistic studies, you need high amounts. And that's what we follow up as well. So we thought, okay, we can isolate the vesicles. I showed you a protocol as to how to improve that, how to work with that. And because we have high numbers of cells, it's easy to obtain these type of vesicles as well. But we still thought, okay, if we can improve the production of EVs by these cells, and, and there was literature, a lot of literature, by uh, exposing cells to calcium ionophore, you, you influence the lysosomal compartments, thereby also the release of vesicles. And we did that. So we thought, okay, let's, let's have our regular cells and we expose them to the calcium ionophore. What happens in this vesicle number then? To be honest, we didn't see a lot on, on uh, the, the size distribution, also the numbers, the, quality, the, the, the quantity of the number of vesicles didn't change. However, if you think about this activation cascade on, on these endothelial cells, we see that exposing them to this uh, calcium ionophore, suddenly the activation, for instance, in the AKT and the ERK dramatically dropped. So apparently there's something changed in these vesicles, although the numbers are similar, but also gave us, uh, well, this is sometimes happening in science, and this is like a luckily observation, but also now we have like our original EVs, but also this calcium uniform, and we can do mass spec proteomic analysis there on the difference, what activates in the or not to understand the mechanism. So we have a starting point and we have something changed, and apparently we can change which, or check which proteins or RNA molecules have changed and we can move that forward. And we did that really extensively. So we, we exposed uh, HVAC cells, also the UVACs to uh, EVs, or the calcium ionophore EVs, or just physiological salt, and we could do uh, proteome analysis, but also we, we zoomed in on the phosphoprotein. And uh, what we could dig out here as well, I will move forward because I think at the end the part is more interesting for you guys as well, is that we dig out uh, the proteome changes, the phosphoprotein, and in, we could zoom in what is this, this calcium ionophore specific part. And, and we, well, this pathway analysis, I think you, you are familiar with those kind of analysis, but in the end, we came back to one big, big gene, it's called PEPA, which is stromalidase, it's like a protease that is present on our EVs based on our proteomic analysis. And what it basically does, it can cleave this, this binding protein that is linked to IGF, and thereby releases IGF and can activate this, the signal cascade here in the endothelial cells. And all these red dots are the prote uh, proteome differences, the phosphoproteome differences that we saw in endothelial cells. So we could really see that this cascade is activated, although not so original because it's already published also by uh, uh, the Austrian group. I don't remember the name now, sorry. So we try to reproduce their effects because IGF is still needed in this activation cascade. So it's not only the vesicle, but it activates something that's in, in the outside uh, environment there. So we try to create knockouts. You can see it here, the pop A knockout is present while the vesicles are still in the same uh, characteristics. We could see with the pop knockout, but also AKT and ERK, well, ERK is a little bit less visible, but at least the AKT signaling is dropped dramatically, as we saw with the calcium ionophore, and also with these assays, 
wound closure assays, migration distance, also sphere of assays, that are, I think, the standard in the field assays that also you guys use. You can see that by removing the PAVA, the effect is gone. So it seems to be one of those key mechanistic parts that leads for the angiogenic stimulus here is, is uh, helping uh, these, these vesicles to promote this endothelial cell activation. And we zoomed in on multiple aspects. I just summarized here so several publications that it's not only on, on the, sorry, here, on the endothelial cells. We also have some, some models where we expose DVs to the fibrotic models, which you can well modulate fibrosis, but um, several leukocytes, uh, cell types, and cardiomyocytes. But for these types, we're still struggling to understand the mechanism. We see the effects that are there, but it's really difficult to pinpoint back to this, this mechanistic aspect. And then coming back to, well, the, the retention and the problems. And I was really surprised by this. So if you inject EVs, which is size-wise completely different than the cell, the cell is micrometer range, and these are nanometer range. I thought these were flushed out easily. However, to our surprise, and, and this is visible in this picture, we, we did an intermycotic injection of EVs with, with this lipid uh, dyes. So you can have this far red lipid dyes now that we can use this camera to really well visualize in time up to five days what happens to these EVs if you inject it into the heart. And this is what you can see. And this is the, the heart well lighting up until like five days you can still see it. And of course there is some some degrees in signal, but at least you can see that that most of the signal is still in the heart. And we're really surprised because with the cells they were just flushed out. You could hardly see them back there. And also uh, together with Wolf Ayman they said this this cleaning mechanisms really well basically remove all the extra matrix and cells from the heart and zoom into this, this uh, well, lipid dye we use for EVs. That you can really see that it's really getting into the interstitial areas where these this EVs can do their job. And apparently they stick around much better than any cell type. And of course the integration mechanisms are made faster and yeah, well, you don't need to couple them with like the cell-cell interactions that you do. Um, because if you compare it, for instance, with the uh, IV injection, because we're all still afraid if you just do tailbone injection, you probably end up with the same results. But you see that the patterns are completely different. And this is the liver. And definitely if I show you here the direct comparison um, of intermycotic injection in the IV, that with IM, you see that the heart is there and it's still there is something on the liver and the other organs sometimes it does, sometimes not. But IV injection, there is a massive well, load into the liver, the end organ where the GP got picked up. They don't go to the other organs. Uh, so that's not surprising, I think, but the surprising part is that it really, the retention in the heart was so high. So we all had concepts and ideas of hydrogels and local delivery strategies to, to do EV delivery, but in the end, we don't need that. Um, but still, these EVs, they, they have this, this job, and so they have a paracrine secretive uh, effect. They, they change the environment, but you still need high numbers and way above physiological relevance. Yeah levels that, that you need to activate something in a dish. Can you imagine what will happen if you do something in an organ? Although we have seen those effects, you still need high dosing, micrograms of all those types of EVs. So we thought, okay, can we change that? These EVs are the national way of communication. If you understand how it works, I will come that with the label. So can we improve the content and the therapeutic load of these EVs? We can also use them just to target, to target cells in the end, also change the system. And, we come with this, this uh, part that it's the kind of the latest data sets that we have. And it's a, a technology where we can load basically proteins inside these EVs. And we call it like a technology of protein delivery, top, top EVs. And basically it, it's based on this. So we have a VSVG as a an, as an, an, uh, protein that helps the production and integration based on the virus uh, backbone it has. But the loading part is linked for DMRA and DMRC. So we have an a part of it's, it's the construct here. So DMRC is, is where the target protein is linked to. And then with rapamycin as an autolog, it binds these two domains. And one domain is in the membrane and one is the target protein exposed to this autolog. And it's loaded into this lipid linked structures. And of course, if you then isolate the vesicles, the, your, your target protein is present. And you can see it as well in this proof concept with the cells. If they expose this construct with this uh, DMRSA and target protein linked to it, or this, this DMRA with the immersion uh, linker towards the lipid membrane. But in a normal cell, the presence in this case, EGFP is everywhere. Well, if you expose it to the ligands, you see that the nucleus becomes more bright, becomes more to the membranes in, inside of the cell or organs. Um, and then we start using it for different uh, reported genes. So for instance, the Cree uh, reporter system that we can use. So, 
it's still the same transaction pre procedure. So we do this DMC, DMRA, and this VSVG in there. In the medium, we can, well, take out basically EVs, and we still use at that moment the authentication steps. And we can use it and look at, at target cells, in this case, and, and query reporter cell line. So what we could see is if you expose them to uh, the ligand or to the different VSVG constructs that all this vesicles coming based on, on this characterization of the NTAs or, or membrane uh, structures, that they are similar. Um, however, that you could see that loading with VSVG improves preloading here. So exposing to the ligands, you can see that the number of particles is increasing with VSVG. But as I said, production and integration in target cell will, will be improved by VSVG. But as soon as you bring in the ligand, loading of the Cree into the vesicles is dramatically increased. And I think this is this is talking by itself. If you look at the number of EGP positive cells in your portal lines, as soon as you have VCVG and, and the ligand present, only over 95% of the cells are targeted with a much lower amount than we did in the past. So this active loading actually works. Uh, also, we figured out that it's dose dependent and also a little bit of time dependent. And also, it's not really determined by which cell type you take as a target cell. So it's not the only energy cell I just showed to you, but also you can look different uh, uh, oncology lines, fibroblasts, or liver cells. Apparently, this loading strategy will work for these type of uh, constructs. And not only for Cree reporter, I'm also busy with uh, CRISPR, uh, kind of the same setup. So loading CRISPR, uh, Cas9 proteins, also with the, uh, some uh, reporting uh, encoding RNAs uh, as, as, a, as an intervention part. And this is a, a reporter that we have in the labs where, uh, well, it's like a frame shift uh, stop uh, on. So as soon as you have Cas9 in these cells, there's a chance of one or two uh, nucleotide frame shifts. So in a maximum of 66% of, of the cells are changed in these reporter cells on one third, move back into a normal frame. Um, so the, the, the maximum amount is 60%. Is so we reach with this trick for like 30 to 35% of efficiencies, I think. At least for these type of systems, it's really uh, promising. Uh, and we try to move that forward now, also in vivo, um, but that's really initial study. So we use this pre reporter model, so I discussed earlier today already in the viva um, that we had. And, and you can inject it via lung inhalation, excuse the muscle, liver, also the heart. Cells are appearing to, to be transferred by this loading strategy. And to answer, for instance, we have now a, a project where we uh, start to do therapeutics as well for PCSK9, for instance, and we target the liver in that way. So we try to do uh, a S9 for PCSK9 to intervene there. And um, well, it's, it's a long story. It helps if you throw it works. Now in vivo, we try to get enough level of, of retention and integration there. Uh, but at least the, the loading strategy works. And also for the future, we're going to move that forward to other cell lines, for instance, as well for the uh, neurons. We have now a collaboration in Germany where neurons are also difficult to intervene with. And this approach apparently works in 85% of the neurons exposed to EGVs to, they become green. So there's also no ways to push that forward and intervene there. Maybe it's something for the endothelial cell as well. And then coming a little bit to this link to this lipid nanoparticles. Um, so lipid nanoparticles basically look like this natural extra vesicles I just described for the last uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, basically, they also have the synthetic uh, by lipid layers, but of course they are synthetic generated by mixing cholesterol and other lipids together in, in this, well, you do it by hand or you do it by this, this uh, microfluidic systems. And what we did here is basically, can we um, uh, start to, to uh, produce this uh, LMPs? And we, what we said, we have now several reporters, but also some therapeutics now that we generate our own modified RNAs, put it in this, this uh, system and we produce really reproducible based on size and calculation efficiency. Um, these lipid nanoparticles uh, in cooperation with Ray Schiffler's lab, which is a nanomedicine lab in our university medical center. And we start to use them as well in our reperfusion models. And basically what you can see and, and appreciate, I think, in the end is that if you inject it through the tail vein, these lipid nanoparticles, they will end up in the liver a lot. However, if you do an injury in the heart, the endothelial barriers are opened a little bit at the good moment, and also the lipid nanoparticles can go in there. And of course, we're now also exploring that if we do intermyocardial injection, if that helps or not, then exploring that a little bit. Um, because if you use it again in this, this uh, Cree reporter mouse and you do this reperfusion model, you see basically well, it's, it's a concentration dependent effect. Uh, you see that basically the, the part that is reperfused and, and, and of course has this open material, you see this red staining on Piri. You can go stain it. It's usually it's a fibroblastic marker, so some kind of myocyte. This, this model RNA can be delivered in the target organs. 
Um, but this, this group usually focus a lot on the oncology field with local injections and also intravenous injections. But we're now zooming into in this uh, cardiac field and, and uh, the people that were in Budapest also show that we are changing now the lipid compositions, try to see whether there are, well, background story here is that the LMPs are developed for liver delivery. So they were optimized based on the lipid com compositions to really get into the liver hepatocytes. So now we're changing the composition of the lipids to see whether it can improve the cardiomyocyte uptake there better. Uh, and also you can, of course, tune for other cell types. And if it works perfectly, in vivo, we still have having some doubts like, okay, but so cardiomyocytes take up these, these new lipid particles way better in the in vitro setup, and then we inject it in vivo, and then it's kind of similar again. So we try to understand what is the difference there. All we have to do something with the maturation state again. So we try to learn from that. Um, but then my final slide here, we can also bring these fields together. And this is also a really uh, recent work that the, the synthetic lipid nanoparticles you can produce, you can put RNA molecules, mod RNAs in there. I just showed you a lot of by the EVs and we can also put in proteins there, we can load that. But what if you can combine that? So you can use the EVs in their national way to escape basically the target cell mechanisms. So I didn't talk about that yet, but the EVs are of course taken up by target cells and they have a way to, es to escape the lysosomal complexes and, and, and the pathways intercellular and they deliver their proteins and their way of action. Well, if you think about the synthetic particles, LMPs, they usually end up, I think for 99% into the lysosomal compartments. So only 1% of the therapeutic reaches the cells. So if you can combine best of the worlds, then probably there's also a way to move that forward. And what we did here is we used extrusion-based technology and on one hand, we make the synthetic LMPs and on the other hand, we had the RVs. We could make like uh, these mixtures with different hybrids. So hybrid means one out of 100 particles is an EV or one out of 50 is EV based and the rest is synthetic. And we start to mix that uh, together and also based on our EV work we did in the past. So with activation of AKT and ERP, you can see by mixing in a higher concentration of the EVs, they still are activating the endothelial cells. Apparently they still have their signals present. They can uh, well mimic the EV original uh, procedures. Um, and I don't know all the details, but also the endothelial cell activation is still uh, present. So REVs could activate this, this migration essence of endothelial cells as I showed you before, but also these hybrids could still do that. And uh, this, this 1 to 50, this mi mixing, uh, only a small part of the EVs already showed this activation signal. Of course, I showed you that's probably PEP A driven, probably it's an activation outside of the cell and not really intracellular. But what we could also do is if we uh, use an uh, SIRNA approach for luciferase, Activity. And we put that into our uh, lipid nanoparticles and mix it with the hybrids. And not only this is still up and running, so for the original activation signals and, and the escape mechanism is still there, we also reduce the surface activity in our target cells. Let's check the paper there. So apparently you can use both worlds, and it seems to work. So you can load RNA molecules into one synthetic part and use still the escape mechanisms of the EV part. That was the conclusion of this paper. Um, but of course, we're still uh, well working on that to put in more target proteins or more RNA molecules for therapeutics. Also, maybe something we can discuss in the future. We're having this this better cardiac targeted LMPs, but also mixing in then parts of, of our uh, new therapeutic approach. Like we would like to zoom in on VEGF as, as one of the most relevant pro angiogenic factor for the heart, or maybe we should put something else in there as well in this mixture. So. Um, and also on top of that, I didn't bring that. We're also now able to really. Uh, put on on south uh, on outside of the vesicles some peptides that enhance the uh, targeting uh, affinity for different target cells. So we have some peptides from literature that is well known to be taken easier up by the endothelial cells, and we put that in there. You see that under flow conditions that that these vesicles are better taken up by the endothelial cells than compared to the control settings. Uh, but I didn't bring that. I just realized I was talking to you this today. So to stop here a little bit, so I think this is uh, showing that there's still a lot of work to do on this vesicles. If we can learn basically how to isolate them uh, in, in, in a standardized way, but definitely how to use their benefits, uh, how they, they normally communicate in, in, in real life, we can change, I think, synthetic system in the end for a therapeutic. I'm not sure if this, this standard isolation in the end will be a therapeutic approach. Um, I think it's still marginal what we see, but if you can really push therapeutic proteins in there, then I think would be uh, a way forward, uh, to be honest, but still with all kind of limitations we have to develop there. For that, I'd like to stop to uh, well, think, of course, the team that basically does a lot of the work. I'm just talking and chatting and try to collaborate further. Uh,
but they do all the good work and well this was still a summer days that we are in my garden with the barbecue nowadays we can't but we have to come here for this type of party thank you for your attention happy to take any answer or any questions thank you host. <laughs>